All right, it's time to lose the mask and get started this morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And it's a good day to be here. The sun is shining outside, and we have a wonderful opportunity to worship him. We do have a couple orders of business to get to before we do that. So I always hate to mention all these things, but we do need to mention it. If you are part of the project that I am working on, all those forms are in two different folders over there on the table. Again, those will be readily available every week. The consent form is just a one-time thing I need for those of you who have not filled out the consent form yet. Please do so and just put it back in that envelope uh, that is there. The other um, questionnaire or the evaluations will be there every week as well. And you can simply fill those out after church if you can and uh, fold them up and then put them back in the same folder. That will be perfectly fine, okay? So that's where those will be. That's where you can put those and uh, again, if you're not able to be here in person for that project, you can watch those videos online. We have them up on Mondays usually, and you can certainly participate that way as well. We have a couple folks that can't be here this morning, and so they're using that video uh, message venue uh, to do just that, okay? Uh, also, this morning, I would love for you guys to grab one of these, and maybe, maybe, just maybe... Um, you can grab one of these when we start singing or something like that. These are our connection cards, and every um, year it's good to get some updates on here. Some of you may have filled one of these out recently. I get that. But if you could use this this morning, that would be very helpful. Hold on to it and grab the pen that goes along with it and simply take that home with you. You don't have to keep it here. Bring that home. That's what they're for. Um, on the back, there will be some other things that we'll talk about this morning as well. So, Keep that card handy, and when you are done and leave the service this morning, all you need to do is put this card in our little mailbox in the back there. There's a sample connection card taped to it. Some of you put your offerings there. That works as well. Those are where the cards can go, too. So put those cards in there on your way out today. So keep these handy. Thank you, Ivers. Thank you, Dan, for passing those out. So today is that day where we get to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is a good thing. That is worth celebrating. We're going to sing some amazing songs here in just a moment that will uh, teach us just that. And so let's bow our heads in preparation for the service this morning. Heavenly Father, today is that special day marked out on our calendars every single year where we celebrate you. We celebrate the fact that you died for our sins and three days later you rose again. You paid for our sins once and for all through that amazing act on the cross, thereby providing us eternal life. And so thank you so much for that yearly reminder, every Sunday reminder of what you've done for us. This morning we celebrate that in a mighty, glorious way. Help us to celebrate that this morning through these amazing songs of worship. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. It is great to be here today, beautiful sunny day, Resurrection Sunday. We're going to sing some songs that, uh, to, to start out that focus on Jesus, focus on what he accomplished, uh, his death, burial, and resurrection. And so let's worship as we do that, as we, as we kind of really look in, into that a little bit and sing those songs, let that get into your heart. Let's all stand as we sing. See him there, the great I am, a crown of thorns upon his head. The Father's heart displayed for us, oh God, we thank you for. Did I?
He who was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold him He who heard humanity's cry Left his throne to wake as a child He became like the least of us Behold him Jesus, Son of God, Messiah The Lamb, the roaring lion Oh, be still and behold
be seated. Let's take a moment and do just that. We'd love to pray. To give than it is to receive, and I think that's true. It's hard for us to receive, especially when we need help, um, because we have to admit something to ourselves that, that we failed or, or whatever it is. And through all of the struggles of life, through all of the battles that we face, sometimes I think we work too hard because Jesus has already provided us the victory. It's, it's already done. And to receive that into our lives during those times is, I think, really important as far as us having victory as well. So we're going to sing about victory, about the victory that he was able to provide us, even from the darkest day, three days ago, to victory. Let's all stand and sing these last two songs. We will lift our eyes, we won't fear the fight, there is one who's stronger, hard pressed on each side, we will not lose sight of the one who's greater, one name, one name holds every
king for criminals and every Pharisee. You came for hypocrites, even one like me. You carried sin and shame, the guilt of every man, the weight of all our time, nailed into your head. You guys are so good. Thank you so much for leading us in that this morning. They had to practice that, and they did a great job. Thank you so much for that. Let's pray. Father God, as we open your word this morning, may your story, as told even through these songs, come alive. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, early on in our lives, we're told not to do it. Why don't we do it? It's mean. It hurts. And, of course, what I'm talking about are 
this idea of calling people names. We don't call people names, do we? Early on, we're taught this crazy saying, though, that goes like this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt us. And that would be great if it was true, right? But we know it's not true. It's so, so wrong. And I don't know what crazy adult decided to teach that to our kids, but that's what we learned, right? But it's, it's a lie. It's false. So to combat that, I think there is the golden rule, which says what? Treat others as you yourselves want to be treated. That's a, probably a better way to live our life. But if you'll give me permission this morning, I do want to call someone some names. Is that okay? And uh, we're going to call, we're going to do some name calling today, I promise, just today. All right, well, today's character, we've been making our way through this series called The Characters of Easter, and we've talked about Mary Magdalene, we've talked about the beloved disciple John, we've talked about Peter and others. Today we finish up with our final character. And when I started out this week, I really didn't know who this character was going to be, but it turns out his name is Thomas. Some of you have heard of Thomas before. Uh, some of you haven't, but we're going to call Thomas some names today, okay? All right, so what do we know about Thomas? We know he's one of Jesus' disciples. He's listed in the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as one of his disciples. But in that, those three Gospels, he is just listed there. There's nothing else about him that we learn. But when we open up to John's Gospel this morning, that's where we're going to go. When we open up to John's Gospel, guess what? There is dialogue. There is Thomas even saying some things, and especially so in and surrounding Jesus' life, his death, and then his resurrection. So it's to those moments that I want to take you to this morning. And again, we're going to start calling Thomas some names. The first name we're going to call him has to do with the first story that takes place. Jesus has just gotten wind that his friend Lazarus is sick. It's found in John chapter 11. But his friend Lazarus is sick. Mary and Martha, his sisters, have sent word to Jesus to come and help immediately. Okay? So, there's a couple problems with this, however. And the problems are twofold. Number one, um, they're about three or four days journey away from Bethany where Lazarus is lying there sick. So it's going to take a while for Jesus and his disciples to get there. Number two, they have just left Judea and Jerusalem. They've just left that area, and guess what? They barely made it out of there alive. They were almost stoned to death in the process. And so when Jesus gets this word and he shares with his disciples, hey, it's time to go back. It's time to go see Lazarus and bring healing to him. Guess what? They're not having any of it. They don't want to go back. They almost died on their way out last time. And Jesus has some back and forth that kind of goes on with them and makes kind of his final plea uh, for them to accompany him back to Bethany to heal Lazarus. And it's at this point that our character this morning, who is Thomas, speaks out. And guess what he says? He says these very words in John chapter 11. Let's go to and die with Jesus. Now, Thomas had some nicknames. Well, one nickname, Didymus, which meant the twin. Maybe he had a fraternal twin or identical twin. We're not exactly sure. But at this point in the story, I think his disciple friends would have been calling him some other nicknames under their breath. We can't say those words here this morning. Nevertheless, I think we can call him Brave Thomas. Don't you think that's fitting? He's very brave, willing to go and die with Jesus at this point in the story. Now, when we use these old paper maps, some of you have these paper maps in your car. How many of you have paper maps still? Some of you do. I happen to have one from Iowa, so maybe the app sites can borrow this when they go back to Iowa. Um, But this paper map of Iowa has all sorts of things on it. What do we find on a map? What kind of things do we find on a map? Some mileage charts. We find some cities. We find interstate. We find all sorts of names, right, of the cities and that sort of thing, names of roads, depending on what we're looking at. We might find the name of a state park 
or a national park. I'm seeing all kinds of things. County names are listed here as well. And if you have one of those old triptychs, like AAA used to put out, do they still do that? I don't know. But we used to get those as kids when we would travel down to Florida, and we'd flip those triptychs over and over and over again until we finally got there. But on those, you would have AAA-approved uh, restaurants and hotels to kind of stay at, that kind of thing. But the problem with any of these kind of paper maps is what? Over time, they start to fade, right? Over time, they start to fade, they get crinkly, they get hard to read. In fact, I found an old map that really is old. It's faded quite a bit. And what happens when things start to fade to that point, you can't read it anymore. It's confusing at best. You can't hardly find any names out there. And at worst, I think it will get you lost, right? If you followed a map that was greatly faded like that one. That's something like what's happening, I think, with Thomas. His map is fading. As we're about to see, there's another name that we can call him. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to open up to John chapter 14 for the next name that I want to call Thomas. Now at this point, we are in the upper room. Traditionally speaking, the upper room is on top of Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And that's where the disciples of Jesus are at this particular point in the story in John chapter 14. They're in the upper room. They're sharing Jesus' last meal with him. Uh, Judas, who we talked about a few weeks ago, has been dismissed. And Jesus is talking about He's talking about leaving them. He's talking about going to prepare a place for them in heaven. Okay, so he's sharing all of this. And I think Jesus was thinking, hey, this is going to offer them great comfort. In fact, it causes quite a bit of confusion instead. And so he sees his disciples and they start to wonder what he's exactly talking about. And so to offer them a little bit more reassurance, here's what Here's what Thomas is, here's what Jesus has says here in verse 1 of chapter 14. He said, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am, and you know the way to where I am going. So that is meant by Jesus to offer a measure of reassurance, right? But it leaves Thomas confused. He's confused exactly by what Jesus has said here. And so what does Thomas say in the next few verses there, verse 5? He says, no, we don't know, Lord, we don't. We have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? It's at this point in the story, I think we can call Thomas by a different name. Maybe we can call him Ignorant Thomas. We'll be nice to him and we'll just simply call him Ignorant Thomas at this point in the story, right? He doesn't know the way. He doesn't know where Jesus is taking them. The map, you might say, is fading a bit. And it's getting less and less clear, it seems, by the day. Now, fast forward a bit. When this event takes place in the upper room, those disciples are only hours or days away from witnessing something horrific and tragic, the cross. They're going to watch their Savior, their Lord, get arrested. They're going to go through the emotions of watching him being led to the courtyard, punished, placed upon a cross, and eventually died. And we talked about the emotions that Mary Magdalene had last week watching this play out. And to some degree, the disciples all experienced this in their own unique way. And Thomas, for sure, is part of that. There is anger. There is grief. There is Great sorrow, great sadness, and probably a lot of fear as they witness their Lord and their Savior go to the cross. This is who they put their faith and hope in, and now he's dead. But then something amazing happens. Something amazing happens. Three days later, 
of course, Jesus rises again from the tomb. He's back alive. You see, it turns out that when Jesus went and he did heal Lazarus, he brings Lazarus back from the dead after four days, that was a sign act of things to come. That was Jesus' way of saying, you know what, I'm going to die, but guess what, I'm coming back. And sure enough, he comes back. An amazing story. It's why we're here today, to celebrate that. Every Sunday is a mini Easter. We celebrate that every Sunday. And this Sunday, Easter Sunday, is the day we celebrate this in a bigger way. But every Sunday does the same sort of thing. And the songs that we sing talk about the same sort of message. But Thomas still isn't buying it. He's not so sure. The map continues to fade, and we have another name that we can call Thomas. Fast forward to John 20. The second time the disciples are in the upper room. In the upper room, those disciples are hunkered down. They are afraid for their life. They too could be arrested. They too could be tried. They too could die for their following of Jesus. They're gathered in the upper room, and out of nowhere, Jesus makes his resurrected body appearance. They had heard from Mary Magdalene, but they had never experienced Jesus in his resurrected form as of yet. And it happens in an instant in the upper room. And Jesus can see the doubt on their faces. And when he looks out upon them, he sees their questioning eyes even as well. And because of that, he shows him the wound in his side. And he shows them the wound in his hands, the nail piercings in his hands. He shows them. And guess what happens? Those disciples were told, those disciples are standing there, and it says that they are filled with joy. They are filled with joy over what's happening. Except for one who is not there, who is missing from the story. If you guess Thomas, you would be right. Here's what it says in verse 24. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. Afterwards, they told him, we have seen the Lord. Now, where is Thomas? The Bible doesn't tell us directly, but we can imagine. I think he's out on a job interview. I think he's out looking for another gig because this Jesus thing didn't work out very well. Like he had heard that, yeah, maybe he's resurrected, maybe he's back. But you know what? The cost of following Jesus is what? It's big. It's dangerous. It will get you killed. The brave Thomas is the ignorant Thomas, and he's about to be doubting Thomas, right? What does Thomas say? He replied to them, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands. Put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. So again, the ignorant Thomas becomes the most famous name that he's known by of all, which is, of course, Doubting Thomas. He's not believing it. He wasn't there for the very first Easter celebration when those other disciples said, praise God, and were filled with joy. So we fast forward eight days, fast forward eight days. There the disciples are again in the upper room a third time. What are they doing? They're hunkered down. They're freaked out. The doors are locked. They're still afraid of what might happen to them for following Jesus. Only this time, guess who's there? Thomas is there this time. And out of nowhere, again, Jesus makes this magical appearance in the upper room. And he says, peace be with you. That was his standard greeting. And then all focus turns to who? Turns to Thomas at that point. And here's what Jesus says to Thomas in verse 27. He says, 
Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Now, various artwork depicts Thomas doing just that, putting his finger into the, um, the hole, into the wounds of Jesus. And um, the most famous, I think, is this Car- Caravaggio uh, painting that many of us have seen. There's Thomas placing his finger into one of those wounds in Jesus' side. However, according to the Gospel of John, it doesn't say that Thomas does that. It doesn't say he does that at all. I think John would have told us if he had. Instead, I think Thomas is struck by two things. Number one, when he sees Jesus, he is struck by his appearance. He looks so very different from the last time he saw him. There's something about his resurrected body appearance. Maybe there's a glow. There's an awe about him. But the second thing I think Thomas is struck by is by those words that Jesus says at the end. He says, don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Another translation says, stop doubting. Believe. There is a famous um, skit or a famous episode of a show called The Bob Newhart Show. Some of you have seen this before, and I wish I could show it to you, but I can't. You can go search this yourself if you've not seen this particular episode before. But in that 70s Bob Newhart show, and Bob Newhart is still alive. He's like 92 or 93 years old now. Still funny. I saw him on a late show one time and still very sharp. But in this particular show, he plays a psychologist, I think, And as part of his psychology, he welcomes people to his office and tries to help them. And in one instance, this lady has been referred to his office, and she has a fear. She has a phobia. Dan, you know this one, right? She has this fear of being buried alive in a box. Have you seen How many of you have seen that episode? That's her fear. That's her phobia. And so Newhart says, here's how it's going to work. It's $5 for the first five minutes of my therapy session with you. He said, I can guarantee it won't take five minutes. And then he proceeds to listen to her for a minute or two, and then he says, okay, here's what I have to offer you. I've got two words. And she's like, should I write this down? And she starts pulling out pen and paper from her purse, and he's like, no, I think you can remember this. And he, he kind of patiently looks at her. Here's, here's the two words I want you to incorporate into your life. And the two words are what? Stop it. Stop it. Stop being a baby. Stop it. And this goes on and on and on a bit. And that's similar to what Jesus does, I think, with Thomas here, although I think Jesus is being a little bit more kind. But he's saying the very same sort of thing, right? Stop doubting me. Stop doubting me and believe. And guess what? This seems to work. Verse 28, the last verse, my Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed, my Lord and my God. And so this once brave Thomas who became ignorant Thomas, doubting Thomas, is now believing Thomas. I like that name for him, the best of all, believing Thomas. Deep down, I have this underlying belief that we are created in God's image, all of us. All humankind is created in his his image. And I have this belief that there are no unbelievers in this world. Like, I have this belief that deep down, everyone believes in their creator, God. They might say they're agnostic, they might say they're um, atheists, they might say all sorts of things, but I believe deep down God has planted that seed in every single one of us to know him and to believe upon him. The trouble is, the trouble is life happens, right? Life happens for you, it happens for me, and as life happens, the map fades, 
The essence of who we are in God begins to fade, and we don't see things as clearly as we once did. Still, in the midst of all of that, trust me, I believe firmly that God is up to something. He's up to something. He's up to something with Thomas. He's up to something with every one of us this morning. This last week, I came across a song by Jordan Feliz. He's a Christian music artist, and he wrote this song called Next to Me. It's on his latest album. I'd heard it before, but I'd never paid attention to the lyrics. So I'm like one of these people that likes the melody, and I sometimes forget about the lyrics. But my wife reminded me of the lyrics. Here's the lyrics to the song. He says, you put an X on my faded map. Draw me a line back to where you're at. I love that. It rhymes a bit, which is always good for me, but it makes so much sense because this is what God has done for Thomas. This is what God has done for you and for me. He has put that X on that map. It might be faded. It might be hard to read, but he's drawn a line back to where God is at so we can be right next to him. That's what the song's about. And that's really what the gospel story is about as well. Regardless of how faded our maps might be, we are drawn back to him by God himself. I love how this story ends. I love what Jesus says. Stop doubting me and believe. Stop doubting me and believe. It's simple. There are no gimmicks. There's no arm twisting. It's simple. Stop doubting me and believe. And I think Easter is a great time to declare that very thing. This has been a rough season for many of us. And perhaps we're coming out of it a bit, although the numbers of COVID here in Michigan are not good. But nevertheless, regardless of how difficult things have been, this is a great time of the year, Easter Sunday, 2021, to declare to God that we believe. And so on your Connect card on the back are two things. I would encourage all of us to use Easter Sunday, 2021, to recommit your life to Jesus. Again, after a long year, I think we could all use a recommitment. Like maybe this year has been filled with doubt, Maybe this year your map was faded severely when it comes to your faith. You lost sight of who you are in God. This is a great time of the year to use something like this, to recommit ourselves to Jesus. So use this connection card to do that this morning. And on your way, again, drop it in the mailbox on your way out. If you've never done anything like that before, like this before, you might want to make this your first time to follow Jesus. And so you check that box instead. We're all at different places. All of our maps have faded in some sense. Nevertheless, the after Easter map is so much more clear. I pray it's clear for you as well. The way back to God. He's drawn a line for every one of us. Let's pray for that today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Thomas a character in our Bibles that we sometimes gloss over, forget about. But God, you called him as he meandered through the faded map of his life from being brave to being ignorant to being doubtful and then to be believing. God, help us all to be believing Thomases today as you have drawn that straight line back to you, God. May our maps, Easter Sunday 2021, be more clear than ever. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to leave you with a benediction that comes from the book of Hebrews. I think it's very fitting to Easter Sunday especially. The writer of Hebrews writes these words. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will, 
May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great Easter afternoon. We will see you next week.